I have an opinion. An opinion that you might not be ready for. Darksiders 3 is just okay. It's an okay game. I've done the research. This is in conflict with the prevailing computations of our day, which put it at the upper bounds of okay. Esteemed viewer, I am in essence arguing that the world, and possibly you, are about 15% wrong. The premise I've just put forward is a heretical departure from orthodox thought, making me an intellectual outcast, like Galileo and Copernicus. An outcast. Don't get me wrong, I like Darksiders, but I think of it as like a bologna sandwich. Or popcorn. You know, you eat it. It's not going to change your world, but it's there, and that is enough. Scholars debate that it may even have a nutrient. Eat. Live. I have a friend who I believe spent six months watching nothing but Steven Seagal movies. For me, Darksiders is something like that. You just replace ridiculously grisly martial arts with some fantasy stuff, and keep adding rules whenever you need a new setting. Now since this third game came out of the corpse of an undead studio, it was already a gift, beyond the norm. With no expectations holding it back, it could achieve the definitive acceptable experience. The exact center of just okayness. It's not something that we need to look at closely or for very long. I wanted to start with a little joke like, Darksiders 3 continues the tradition that Darksiders 2 started of ignoring Darksiders 1. But I just realized that I gotta meet you guys in the middle. Some of you probably didn't play the first two. So to sum it up, Darksiders 3 is, from its inception, a sidebar. Understand that it's asking you to engage with a tangent, an incidental scenario. Now it's, it's difficult to explain how this feels. Just imagine being pitched one thing and then shifting to something completely different. Kidding, of course, but just a quick rundown. Uh, first game follows War, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, who was summoned to Earth for you guessed it, apocalypse stuff. The world is ending, what else is new? Now War feels that something is jacked up though because his team is running at about one quarter horsepower here. Oh well, he says, murderingly. While having a gay old time, he mysteriously loses the full might of his cosmic station and proceeds to get dumpstered by a tutorial boss. Scrub. After the jump, we learn that War is in big trouble with the only power in the universe capable of standing as a neutral party between the Holy Host of Heaven and the Scourged Legion of Hell. Several angry heads in a cave. Turns out he should not have gone because the seals, which is uh, this set of wind chimes that are supposed to remain unjostled until the end of time, don't worry about it too much, they didn't go off, okay? Essentially, he did not have a warrant. Thus, war is responsible for terminating the eternal ceasefire between Heaven and Hell and dooming all terrestrial life. They call him a loose cannon, tell him to turn in his badge and his horse, and that he's to be suspended. With pay. Our boy notes that things were already getting turnt before he even got there, and demands the right to go back downtown and kill things until the things that are dead match the things that did this. Now to actually give the player something to do besides curb stomp the biomass of Earth, the war we get has his power stripped down by the bosses, since he's basically a convict at this point. But he can still pick up a car and express ship it to Canada with no effort. I want you to remember this for later. It'll be useful when we start talking about MAD. I'm just kidding, there's no way I'll actually get to Darksiders 3 before I give up on this and decide to lay down. Okay, so this is an action-adventure title with ability-based lock and key. Reminiscent of Zelda, uh, Metroid, all the tools to solve dungeons are conveniently hidden inside of the dungeons. Darksiders is not so much mimicking Zelda as it is passionately describing it to you over lunch. Wow, so they make you get every piece of the Triforce, huh? You say, over your mashed potatoes. Is that... is that good? You don't understand, says Darksiders, as it drinks a Shasta. It's the best. The more surprising part of this escapade is the unexpectedly elaborate escape rooms. I was shocked at the amount of switches, levers, and turntables in this game. Movable environments. This shit got surprisingly involved. There's a goddamn portal redirection carnival funhouse in a console game for Christ's sake, the ambition. You might wonder why a man with Popeye-sized hands and strength which is also nearly Popeye-like would solve magic puzzles to unlock doors instead of, say for example, throwing a car through them. Well, it's because someone told us to, which is also a summary for the whole game. You ask for directions to the guy in charge, they give you a bunch of errands. It's even accidentally thematically appropriate, which we'll get to in just a minute. The guy who wrote this, comic book artist who designed all the characters, just isn't great at coming up with reasons for a video game to happen. Unless he secretly wanted War, Rider of the Red Horse, him to whom it was given to take peace from the Earth, to love puzzles. 
That's also a possibility. Eventually, we learn that this whole kerfuffle is due to warmongering from heaven. Yeah, you heard me. See, they were sick of peace, and harps make boring music anyway, and so they planned to break all of the seals except one. This would, apparently, start the fireworks but not summon any horsemen. Hmm, yes, that must be how it works, the player now says out loud for some reason. Stage two of this doomsday plan was to kill every demon really, really fast. Maybe with like a big anvil, or a, a giant dipping sauce packet full of holy water. Bottom line, no planner needed because this part is a sure thing. Stage three, heaven plans to have a guy reforge the seals before anybody gets to the scene. Okay, to be fair, he's not just some guy. He's a magic dwarf with a hammer. That part is established. But I thought it sounded silly, so I skipped it. For now. Finally, they pin the whole thing on hell. Easy game. In the flashback, we learned that the heads knew something was up, so they injected war into the situation to take the fall. His quest for vengeance serves their purpose. You might think that they could just order him to do that in the first place, especially since he's all about serving the balance, but it's strongly implied that they want war to die in the process. The big piece is that the council is untrustworthy and shady. Some would even say corrupt. The old explanation, someone told us to, no longer suffices. Following orders will not solve this great problem. We must become justice. I'm not going to get too deep into this because this is just a history lesson, but the biggest thing this game nailed was memorable character interactions. Like you'd expect from a superhero movie. Great one-liners, internal logic not really needed. The big bad guy would kill you. Hell, he'd kill me, says a demon. War responds. Oh, sorry, didn't know I was talking to a bitch. Now that's a cool dynamic, but then he sends you on a grocery run. King of all these memorable interactions, and probably the most memorable thing about Darksiders 1 overall, is its ending. See, in the last fight, the final seal gets broken. A remaining angel points out the war has made an enemy of all creation, even though he did prove he was innocent. What are you gonna do? Punch the whole universe alone? Not alone. Oh, baby. Four-player co-op, this is gonna be so lit! Darksiders 2 happened. Darksiders 2 is a single-player game. The creative director would explain that both they and the publisher agreed they weren't powerful enough yet, so they were sent to collect a forsaken relic from a lost realm. Listen, you ever play a Darksiders game? You'll think that's hilarious. And it's fair. Not the thing I said. The thing I said was nonsense. The thing he said. How many four-player God of War-style combat games have you played with Zelda-themed puzzles? Pretty big undertaking. Okay, so it wasn't four-player. What was it? Darksiders 2 is a shiny, polished, expansive digression. It is a well-tuned tumbleweed rolling away on a guided tour of New Zealand. Darksiders 2 is so far afield and so full of stuff that by the end of it, even the main character is sighing in confused exasperation. I love it. It is simultaneously my favorite Darksiders game and also one of the top five buggiest PC ports I've survived. Imagine a game with Diablo-style loot that may crash if you look at it. V-Sync might fix this, but maybe not. So sometime before War's Revenge Rampage, his brother Death bucks the rules and goes looking for a way to just bring mankind back to life. They can't convict you of a crime you magically uncrimed. That's just the law. And man he looks. Everywhere. A world tree. The underworld, even though there's also a hell. The Forged Lands. They took larger than life and they ran a marathon with it. There are dwarves. Remember Hammer Guy? Your boy was part of a race of people who built heaven and hell. Which confirms my favorite piece of Darksiders lore. This blade is more ancient than you, Ryder. The Scottish accent is older than the universe. The scope of the game exploded. The feature set exploded. THQ exploded. Later, and due to circumstances which are more complicated than a single game, it might not be the most original thing in the world, but you don't need originality if you can get your execution to consistently kick ass. I can probably recommend Darksiders 2 to nearly anybody in a general audience, but they had better be one of those it's the journey, not the destination type of people. You remember what I said about reasons we can come up with for things to happen? Once again, the only reason is I want mine. I may have need of a blade. Is your need greater than ours, horseman? I think not. Prove worthy. And mayhaps we can... You could say that when you bend the rules to do business, sometimes the business does you. But that's very vague and confusing, so you probably shouldn't. 
Even something as simple as a task balloons into a hilarious, fat-ass undertaking. But for all its circuitous paraphrasticating, which is the most overblown way I could think of to say, what am I even doing? Darksiders 2 does set a standard. From what I can tell based on the intentions set forth by the creators, a successful single horseman Darksiders game establishes and characterizes the motives and methods of the unique horsemen. How they fight, how they move, who they are. These are the parameters, the benchmarks by which we should judge Dark Spiders 3, eventually through various magical contrivances. Death succeeds in resurrecting man. If you're keeping count, the stakes which had been raised have now been lowered, or I guess like restaked as defending man or something, probably. My thought is, if you're going to blue ball everybody and tell a bunch of prequels around and before the events of your story, you should probably bring your A-game and make sure that it's interesting. I told you that story so I could tell you this one. Darksiders 3 uh, occurred, I guess. Let's start with the first thing that happens. The game starts. Lo siento el spoiler. The third horseman, Fury, is sent to Earth to capture the seven deadly sins who have escaped from prison or something. Really? That's your whole pitch? The world is being used as bong water by demons and we're worried about too much naughtiness? Oh well. A casual observer can tell that this is a reheat of story beats from Darksiders 1. The council's up to something fishy, probably gonna betray us. Got it. Starting with a concept like the seven deadly sins, which is already very familiar to most people, is gonna be a challenge to make interesting in the first place. But boy, we did it! Correction, we did not actually do it. Wrath is a flaming hot gladiator. Pride is an angel looking down on everything. Lust is like just a dude. Points for androgyny, but can we not play it safe here? Where's the edge? You got a whole M for mature to work with. Dante's Inferno was M, and I'm pretty sure it made Satan's penis a playable character. Surprise me. Compare this against the design of Tiamat from the first game. A long-toed bat with udders. Come on. Guys, you don't got me. I'm already out. Okay, no, not really. Let's try the movement out. I bring this up because this is one thing that's been used to inhabit the horse mans. Think of them as archetypes, classes. Not because I said so, because he said so. Kind of depth we're introducing in Darksiders 2, you'd want them all to play a little bit differently and they start to maybe fit into class archetypes that you might see in other games. They are so different. Um, they play different. Um, they fight differently. They even move around the world differently. There, see? I didn't make that up. So Death is a rogue. He's nimble and acrobatic. There's a fair bit of climbing. A reasonable person would say there's more than sufficient climbing. Being reasonable is boring. Let me try it a different way. Sometimes, playing Darksiders 2 is like watching someone do a backflip so they can smack their own ass. Quote me on that shit. Use or overuse aside, the system is there. It helps create a person. This part is secondary in Darksiders 3. Fury's archetype is mage. She's magic. And my beef with this game is they give her motions as a mage, but they're unwieldy and stilted. You know, stiff. I'm clarifying because I just learned that the word stilted can also mean on stilts. That's so stupid. <laughs> I can't believe that's real. You swing with a whip. The swing sequence is static. You can't change your angle once you're attached. And you have no control over the speed of the swing. You press one button, connect, and the release is automatic. If you want a different angle, you would rotate in the pre-connection jump. But you will never want a different angle all swing sections are straight through. This seems like a missed opportunity to me. I was hoping it would let you like play around with the timing or the angle. You know, like, like whiff like a chud sometimes and eat shit. Is this game from a place where swings are not fun for children? I was surprised that the whip really doesn't do a lot. With the whip you could pull stuff to you, swing people around, you know, like use it to create leverage so that you can get yourself up to higher places. So far, Fury is the only rider who is not capable of jumping and pulling herself towards something in the distance. You do get additional movement abilities and they definitely are magic, but they're also stiff and stilted. You unlock an extra jump. Okay, why does it go to almost exactly the same height whether I charge it or not? I know what you're thinking. I always know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you're exaggerating. You must need that half an inch somewhere. Maybe you do.
But seriously, I never found a place where a charge was necessary. Maybe this is a holdover from early on, where they thought you'd be able to combine abilities? But just like Meatloaf, you won't do that. Abilities are tied to stances. You can't switch stances if you start using the ability until you land. I would guess for some people this is not a deal breaker. It just makes the navigation feel kind of slowed down and lack dynamism. Also, I lied. You will combine abilities, just not in the middle of a jump. When you have three or four effects to combine, you do start seeing those quick little brain teasers from the first games. I like it. But it takes a while to get there. You want the truest juice? You know that dark cider? With all these games, I'd like them to get to the combining abilities part about four times faster than they do. Every time with this series, they're like, kill a bunch of guys, isn't this so sick? And you're like, I mean, it's alright, I guess. Kinda bored. I guess that's the best segue I can do. Let's talk about the combat. From what I understand, this game is trying to push back on the player a little bit harder, which is a fair update if you want to engage the player more compared to the old titles. Here's the professional breakdown. The initial thought was, we wanted to set up the combat in a way that it's like the encounters are more meaningful, so you have to be more tactical and actually understand like how they behave and how they react to your attacks to also make it uh, instead of like um, kind of just a button measure, like more challenging. The industry response was about what you'd expect. Dark Souls, was that kind of the part yeah, so, of it? I mean, Unlike previous games, Healing items have a startup animation, you have to find a safe place to use them. And, while you can cancel most things in the beginning, some of these heavier animations you can't cancel with the dodge in the middle. As ideas go, this whole tactical understanding enemy responses thing seems kind of unfinished to me. It's irrelevant for singles, because you just stun lock them to death. And because most of your attacks don't create big openings, and most enemies attack very cocainally, I would say it's irrelevant for group fights as well. When I look at the speed of incoming attacks here, I see the pace of a regular action game. I see reaction speed. I don't see anything super tactical. Player response was mixed. Some found the dodge inconsistent. What they didn't know at first was that they were playing with different dodges. Difficulty setting affects how strict the dodge is, which is your only defensive option. Whether or not this was made clear enough, I do think it's at least an interesting idea. A lot of games be like, here you go, here's your difficulty dial. Hmm. What would have been nice here is more defensive options. Specifically because, well here, take a look. Five attacks in half a second. You try to raise your offense to match enemies, you'll find a lot of stuff you can't do. Weapon switching can only happen so fast? Why? You turn on a spell. It doesn't turn off. It runs through all your mana. Why? It's just passive damage. It's not changing how I have to fight. You find space to charge an attack. The charged attack does the same amount of damage whether you charge it all the way or not. First time I tried to play this game, I bounced off it because the pace made it feel like two buttons over and over. Enemies are so quick that most of the time, you finish a counter, it's time to dodge again. Matter of fact, on release, you could still take damage in the middle of a just dodge perfect counter. So you land a perfect dodge, you start this big thick animation, and you can take damage in the middle of it? But that's the kind of thing I mean. They forgot that they handed out speed. They gave everybody speed. They gave me like speed 2. That's the wrong speed! Now look, it's time to be real here. Darksiders 3 was never going to reach the absolute heightest of darkest of sides. When the Nords purchased THQ and its properties, they discovered that they had been making it rain on dumbness. 50 million for a game, they said. That's ridiculous. Are they right? Well look, I don't beatbox about my bank statement on here. This ain't some kind of financial... Yeah, they're right. Looking back on it now, the Darksiders team says, maybe we would have done two smaller. Compared against these as a return to form, Darksiders 3 seems unfinished, but that's about what you'd expect. For a budget ten times smaller, with less polish, less execution overall, yeah, it doesn't realize Fury as fully. And yeah, the story kind of retreads with exactly the same reveals. Oh my god, the cancel set me up in an overly complicated way so that I would die instead of just using their infinite cosmic power to kill me themselves. Incredible. Also, I'm a pawn in a larger game. Hey, y'all got any of that Satan cutscene? Hmm. It's still a fine hack and slash, but it's not really something that makes you think, hmm, I can't wait to see what's next. Which is fine, because that would be a weird thing to say about a bologna sandwich. 